This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Hollyfant. In our collective 70 plus years of reading fantasy and gaming content, we here at the Word of the Week have developed a finely honed sense for out of place details. Where other gamers lack our history with the game and our attention to detail, and so might never notice an innocuous little bit of gaming strangeness, might never notice there is anything slightly weird or strange going on in the latest rule set from Paizo Publishing or module from Wizards of the Coast, to us, such oddities leap off the page. They are as impossible to ignore as an elephant in your living room. And by the way, that is the original form of the phrase. These days, we refer to a detail that cannot be ignored as an elephant in the room, and the phrase is often used in the context of something that everyone knows is there, but that no one seems to be addressing. It appears the phrase only came into common usage in the 1950s. It was used in a couple of different newspapers. In 1959, the New York Times ran a story in which they said school funding had become a problem equivalent to having an elephant in your living room. It's so big, you just can't ignore it. Another story earlier in that decade in the Charleston Gazette that referred to some problems in various American cities quipped that Chicago is an old Indian word that means get that elephant out of your room. So what was our particular elephant in the room? Well, while everyone else was nodding along with the latest Dungeons & Dragons adventure module, Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, and enjoying it as a perfectly normal excuse to adventure across the surface of the Nine Hells and pay homage to the classic Planescape campaign setting of old, we were distracted by this one strange little detail that probably no one else thought anything of. Why is there a floating, glowing, miniature, magical, divine, amnesiac elephant named Lulu leading the party through hell? Lulu is a supporting character in the latest Dungeons & Dragons module. The city of El Turol in the Forgotten Realms is a city that has enjoyed the magical protection of the gods of light for several decades after an incident with a vampire. It is also a city whose guardians, the Hell Riders, are famous for leading a cavalry charge straight into hell to stop an invasion of devils. Much to everyone's surprise, the Turl disappears in a smoking crater. And Avernus, the first of the nine hells, is inside that crater. Now, strictly speaking, Lulu is a holyphant, not an elephant. A holyphant is a small, highly magical creature from the divine realms. They serve as messengers and assistants to good-aligned gods. They are loyal friends, just and honest. And while they are generally gentle creatures, they cannot abide injustice and will seek to punish malefactors wherever they find them. Holyphants take the form of miniature golden-furred elephants with tiny fluttering bird wings. Their most powerful abilities include a blast of noise from their trunks loud enough to shatter bone and blow out eardrums, and a spray of sparkling glitter clouds that sears evil creatures. Now, all of that actually makes perfect sense. Nothing in that paragraph seems weird to us, and as much as we want to complain about Wizards of the Coast's tendency to force a cute, quirky, comedic mascot character into everything they do, regardless of what it does to the tone of the adventure or the world, we have to admit that this particular quirky, cute, comedic mascot is, at least, not contrived or out of place. That doesn't make her any less annoying, though. But we won't editorialize. Wizards of the Coast didn't invent the Hollyfant. It's been a thing in Dungeons & Dragons for a long time. Specifically, it's been a Dungeons & Dragons monster since 1983 when Gary Gygax included it in the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Monster Manual 2. That supplement, the third collection of monsters for the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons game after the Monster Manual and the Fiend Folio, that supplement was very well received at the time. 
See, fans of the game loved Gary's weird and quirky creations, but Gygax, as the co-creator of Dungeons & Dragons, hadn't been creating much. In fact, for several years prior to Monster Manual 2's release, Gygax hadn't actually put out any material of his own. Other creators had taken up the mantle. He was too busy running his rapidly growing company, TSR, and Gygax just didn't have time for the creative work. But then, in 1982, he hired Brian Bloom to help manage the business operations of the company. Of course, that would prove to be a fateful decision later on when the Bloom brothers orchestrated Gygax's ouster from the company, but that's another story. Anyway, Monster Manual 2 was a collection of high-level creatures which GMs could use to populate the game's many outer planes. Those are the divine realms of the gods. And they were full of weird and wacky creatures inspired by mythology. So with Bloom on board managing things, while Gygax didn't create all of the monsters in the book, he did create many of them. And his signature style led to the endurance of many such beasts. Perhaps the most well-remembered are the weird geometric modrons, who occupy the planes of law, order, and clockwork precision. The Hollyphant was one of the creatures that appeared in that tome, and it returned to the pages of Dungeons & Dragons in the cult classic Planescape setting in the game's second edition. And that's where we remember it from. As soon as we saw the description of Lulu the Hollyphant, we remembered the Hollyphant from the 1995 supplement The Planescape Monsters Compendium Appendix 2, and the iconic art by Tony Di Terlizzi, whose oddly stretched and scribbled style became the signature art style for the entire Planescape setting. And since the modern adventure serves as a callback and homage to everything Planescape, it's only fitting to have a Hollyphant fluttering around. But, as we said earlier, Hollyphants aren't the same thing as elephants even though they appear similar. So technically, the elephant in our room isn't an elephant at all. Speaking of remembering things, have you ever wondered about that whole memory thing? Why do we associate elephants with long memories? Well, one reason is that pachyderms actually do have excellent memories. By the way, we should also note that the word pachyderm, which comes from the Greek pachydermata, and means thick-skinned, is an obsolete scientific term. Once upon a time, it referred to a variety of non-cud-chewing mammalian quadrupeds, which included the rhinoceros, the hippopotamus, the camel, elephants, pigs, and a few other critters thrown in for good measure. The order was broken up, and its members reclassified because it was just a bit too broad, and there weren't enough uniform, defining characteristics to make it a useful classification and pachyderm became pretty much a synonym for elephant. To be as definitive as possible, elephants are mammals of the order Proboscidea. And, in fact, they're the only family of animals still living in the order Proboscidea. The order includes a number of extinct creatures, like mammoths and mastodons, and the name comes from the Latin for big nose, so you can guess the defining feature. But where were we? Oh yeah, elephant memory. At an average height of 8 to 13 feet from ground to shoulder, and an average weight about 8,000 to 16,000 pounds, elephants are the largest living land animal on Earth. And elephants are also among the smartest creatures on Earth. And that is due in part to their impressive encephalization quotient. That fancy scientific term is used to describe the size of an animal's brain compared to the size of its body. An elephant's brain weighs over 10 pounds and is about twice as big as you'd expect a creature of its size to be. And by the way, in case you're wondering, the human brain is about seven times as massive as it should be relative to our body size. Chimpanzees come in at 2.5 and pigs come in at a measly 0.27. And it turns out, the brain mass is actually going to good use. See, elephants are highly social and highly tribal creatures much like people. In fact, social, tribal, and intelligent seem to go together in the evolutionary world. An elephant can remember the identities of about 30 other elephants, mostly by the scent of their urine, but also by general appearance. They retain that memory for a long time. Young male elephants often leave the herd upon reaching early adulthood to explore and build their strength and then return sometime later. 
when they return, they are recognized and welcomed back by the herd. And when elephants of different herds have positive interactions, they remember those interactions later when they encounter each other again. In fact, elephants are so social and have such good memories that they recognize the remains of dead relatives. When an elephant encounters the remains of a deceased relative, they will stop for a time and even touch the remains with their trunks before moving on. Not only do they remember their dead, they even seem to mourn them. While we're on the subject of elephant funerals, we should take a moment because we've all heard the stories and we've all seen the Lion King. We should take a moment to examine the idea of the elephant graveyard or elephant burial ground. Are they a real thing? Are there really giant stockpiles of ivory left behind by generations of elephants all going to the same place to die? Well, yes and no. It is true that you can often find sites in the wild where a large number of elephants have passed away and left their mortal remains. But this is not due to elephants suddenly feeling some primal call to an ancient hidden location where they are meant to find their final rest. It's an accident of nature. First, elephants are migratory, and herds tend to follow the same migration routes as previous generations, year after year. So, dying elephants tend to end up in roughly the same places, generation after generation. Moreover, when elephants become too old or sick or injured to migrate, they generally settle in a spot with easy access to food and water and live out their final days. It's a matter of survival. And once again, that leads to many generations of elephants passing away in the same place. For those reasons, groups of elephant remains are often found close together in the wild, and that has led to legends about elephant graveyards, particularly among hunters and poachers who are seeking treasure troves of easy ivory. But to get back to these particular elephants in this particular room, elephants do have very good memories. A number of scientific studies in the last half century have confirmed that. They remember their herds, they remember who has been good to them, and they also remember who's been bad. Studies of African elephants have shown that they remember being injured, and they hold grudges. Elephants who have been injured by hunters from certain African tribes learn to recognize them by their traditional garb and will act violently if they ever see them again. In fact, Despite being recognized as generally peaceful creatures, elephants are also extremely aggressive. Male elephants are particularly prone to violent outbursts when they enter a state called must, a Hindi word meaning intoxicated, in which their testosterone levels spike up to 60 times the usual level. During mating season, aggression seems to be a valued trait among elephants looking for mates. One study from 2007 found that nearly 80% of all calves in a herd were sired by males in must. And the tendency toward explosive bursts of rage and the long memory of elephants has led to long-running conflicts between humans and elephants in India and Sri Lanka. 300 deaths a year occur in these nations due to elephant attacks. Many of these occur when elephant herds attack human villages in revenge for decades prior hunts and culling. Competition over resources and land between humans and elephants, and the long grudges and fears each species bears against the other, have exacerbated the situation for decades. And because elephants have such good memories, they're also somewhat unique in the animal kingdom. They can suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. After witnessing the destruction of their herd at the hands of hunters, poachers, and cullers, surviving elephants show many of the telltale symptoms of PTSD. So, elephants are loyal to their friends and loved ones, they remember those who have treated them well, and they are prone to violent outbursts of rage and hold long-standing grudges when wronged. Which does sound a lot like the tiny hollyphant. And while real elephants don't use magic, their trunks are quite amazing. The first thing to understand about an elephant trunk is that it isn't actually a nose, not completely. In fact, it is a melding of their nose with an elongated and modified upper lip. The flexible muscular trunk ends in finger-like growths at the tip, which can be used for grasping and manipulating. African elephants have two such growths, while Asian elephants have only one. And elephants have such fine motor control with their trunks 
They are notorious for manipulating mechanisms to free themselves from enclosures at zoos and animal parks. Mostly though, elephants use their trunks to feed and drink. They strip vegetation from tree branches or rip up small brush and grasses. Contrary to popular belief, they do not suck water through their trunk to drink. Instead, they inhale the water and hold it in their trunk, then squirt it into their mouth. An elephant's trunk can hold up to two or three gallons of water at a time. That said, we should point out that the myth about elephants holding fruit in their trunks to ferment until it turns to alcohol is just that, a myth. Elephants don't make booze in their trunks. However, they do use their trunks as sandblasters. Elephants will inhale quantities of dust and dirt from the ground and then shower themselves in it. The dust helps cool them down in hot climates and the coating helps prevent sunburn and repels insects. Elephants have excellent olfactory senses and when swimming, they can hold their trunks out of the water like a snorkel to breathe. And as if that weren't enough to convince you that trunks are amazing, thanks to an elephant's big brain, intelligence, and social community, they've developed a sophisticated means of trunk-centered communication. They generate a range of different trumpeting noises and low-frequency rumbles below the range of human hearing. These sounds tend to travel farther and are useful for communicating with the whole herd at a distance. So yes, we're fine with Lulu the Hollyphant's amazing trunk with its sonic attacks and the sprays of evil repelling sparkle dust. Well, as, as fine as we can be with something described as glitter in our D&D game. Even the divine origin of the Hollyphant is a messenger of the gods, and the wings seem perfectly well thought out if you know a few things about the Hindu religion and ancient Hindu writing. According to the ancient Vedas, the Hindu sacred texts, the king of the gods, Indra, is often depicted as riding a white elephant. Now, Indra is no longer worshipped as the king of the gods in many forms of modern Hinduism, but still plays an important role as a weather god and the keeper of the heavens. Many of the principal gods have Vahana, divine mounts, that carry them around the world. And Indra's elephant, Erevan, is not just any elephant. It's the first elephant ever. See, when Lord Vishnu's Vahana, the godbird Garuda, was born, Vishnu's creator aspect, Brahma, took up the eggshells and sang holy songs over them until Erevana, the white elephant, rose from them, leading eight male and eight female elephants into the world. And speaking of elephant deities and divine vehicles, many are familiar with the popular depiction of Ganesha, also known as Ganpati, the Hindu god of new ideas and new beginnings. Ganesha is just about the most easily recognized of the Hindu gods, thanks to his elephant head. His name derives from a bit of a play on words, as he is both the lord of the Gana, meaning people in Hindi, and the lord of the Ganas, a tribe of supernatural creatures who served his father, the deity Shiva. Ganesha is viewed not just as a deity of new beginnings, but is also a remover of obstacles. And that's why he is often depicted as riding his Vahana, a specific species of rat known as the bandicoot rat that is adept at getting anything it wants. Granted, it's a large bandicoot rat. The point is that the idea of a divine elephant with bird wings who acts as a clever guide and helps the party overcome obstacles is also totally thematic and well within the fantasy adventure genre. But we started this off by saying that a magical divine flying elephant who is just and loyal and who tirelessly fights evil and who would have an excellent memory if not for an encounter with the river Styx and who can blast enemies with sonic attacks and evil repelling dust from her trunk stands out to us as really weird. So weird, the weirdness cannot be ignored. So what then, given everything we've said, is the problem? It's that her name is Lulu. The name just does not fit the genre, or the world, or the themes of Hindu mythology by way of Western medieval fantasy at all. Why the heck did they name her Lulu? It turns out there may even be a reason for that. See, there was actually a very famous elephant named Lulu. Still is, actually. And it is a very bittersweet story to end on. 
thankfully, more sweet than bitter. The bitter part is this. Back in the late 1960s, the San Francisco Zoological Garden, then called the Flyshacker Zoo, had two African elephants on display, Maybelle and Judy. And the two were very good friends until Judy passed away. Maybell, missing her companion, grew despondent, depressed, and the folks at the zoo were very worried about her. And so in 1968, they purchased another elephant from the kingdom of Eswatini, also known as Swaziland, for 4,000 US dollars. That's the equivalent of $28,000 today. And that elephant's name was Lulu. And her arrival at the zoo and meeting with Maybell for the first time briefly made national headlines. Eventually, the two became very good friends. For 36 years, they carried on their friendship at the zoo. And then, in 2004, Maybell passed away. At the same time, increasing concerns over the treatment of elephants in captivity in general and over the specific conditions for elephants at the San Francisco Zoo led the zoo to cease keeping elephants in its park. Lulu was transferred to the ARC 2000 Animal Sanctuary run by the Performing Animal Welfare Society. They provide sanctuary for animals born or raised in captivity that can't be returned to the wild. Now, Lulu had some trouble adjusting to the new location at first but she soon calmed down and settled in. The sweet part is that we checked into it, and at the time of this recording, Lulu is still a happy and healthy resident of the ARC 2000 Sanctuary and lives alongside her friends and fellow African and Asian elephants Maggie, Mara, Tika, Toka, Gypsy, Nicholas, and Prince. So, while the name Lulu stands out to us as an odd little detail that doesn't fit the otherwise totally normal for the genre magical flying glitter spraying elephant angel, and we can't be sure of the reference, we like to think that Lulu's name is an homage to the gentle giant who provided a loyal friend and companion to a fellow elephant who lost her loved ones 30 years before. So, we'll let it pass. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Thank you.